Hi, and thank you for joining me on this webinar for annual results reports. Now, before I go any further, all of us together are going to take a big deep breath in through our nose, out through our mouth. I'm gonna lift my shoulders up to my ears and back down my back. I find annual results reports one of the hardest things to talk about, to teach, to do, all of the above. So I am right there with you. If this one is scary or overwhelming or a little hard to understand, I feel you. And because of that, I want to be really, really mindful about that as we go through this so that we can work together to make this easier to understand and easier to implement into our school counseling programs. But I wanted to start out with that deep breath because it helps me and I think it'll help me help you. And hopefully you'll remember throughout here to pause, take a break, take a breath, whatever you need as we learn about this and together we can do it. We'll figure it out. So let's do it. I'm Sarah. I think you all know me by now. I am happy to help you build a comprehensive school counseling program. That is my whole job at the Oklahoma State Department of Education is to help you all in the trenches do the really, really good work that our schools and our families and our students need. So let's dive in. Like we said, we're talking annual results reports today. We're talking about where it fits in the ASCA national model. We're going to dive really deep into what those um, result reports look like. There are two different types, the classroom and small group results report. So that's one, but we use it both with classrooms and with small groups. Then we have a second results report, which is that closing the gap results report. We'll look at the templates. We will talk about how to report the results that we find. We'll talk about implementation steps, reflection, and summary. This is more important than ever with this topic because we don't want to shy away from using results reports just because they're scary and just because it's overwhelming. We're not going to be perfect the first time we use them. So if these are brand new to you, don't expect perfection. Mine still weren't perfect after using them for multiple years, and that's okay. It still gave me really, really good information to better serve my students and to strengthen my school counseling program. And guess what? Each year they got better. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep striving to get better and we're going to keep working towards better comprehensive school counseling programs that serve our students. So let's do it. As we know, if you've been joining me for all these webinars, we have our Ask a National model that is our framework that outlines a comprehensive school counseling that has positive impact on our students. It's data informed, it's delivered to all students. It, these results reports really define what school counseling, comprehensive school counseling should look like. So while even these are, though these are the scary, overwhelming pieces, at least to me, they are so vital because it's what makes our programs data informed. It's what makes our programs close achievement and opportunity gaps. And it's how we know that our students are better because of our program. We don't know that if we don't have these results reports. So we, oops, we will, um, talk all things results reports today, which falls under the assess component of the national model. So if you've joined from the beginning, we talked through the define, the manage, and the deliver, and now we're on the fourth and final component, assess. And we'll see there highlighted that we are talking annual results reports today, which is one of the ways we assess our school counseling program. Now up there in blue, I also have action plans highlighted because if you're not familiar with action plans, go back and watch that webinar first, okay? Because these results reports tie directly into the action plans that we made during the manage component. So we can't really use these results reports if we didn't first do the action plan. So the action plan typically um, is made at the beginning of the school year before we deliver the student services. It's our plan of action. Then we deliver the direct and indirect student services, and now we're assessing them. So it kind of goes in that order. So make sure you 
thoroughly understand action plans before we try to dive in to the results reports that go with them. They're, they're partners. All right, so the assess component is that fourth and final component of the ASCA national model that tells us that we need to regularly assess our program to determine its effectiveness. We engage in assessment to inform the improvements needed in our school counseling program and in order to show how our students are different as a result of the program. So assess really has two main goals shows us where we need to continue to improve and also shows how students are different as a result of our program. So you can see just how important the assess component is because it's our job security, right? It shows why our school counseling program matters, but it also shows us how to continue to get better. Very, very important. And I find that the assess component is the one most often left out of a comprehensive school counseling program. A lot of school counselors are really good at defining their programs. They use the student standards, they use the professional standards of competencies, they use the eth ethical standards. They're really good at managing, they have calendars, they've got awesome outcome goals, they're doing all the manage component. Then they're great at delivery. Of course, we love those direct and indirect student services. And then assess, not so much. That's really, really typical. And so we want to work towards strengthening this because it is so, so vital. In the assess component, we assess our program and ourselves. So those are the two different components you'll see here. We have program assessment, where we're looking at our school counseling program through the school counseling program assessment and the annual results reports, which is what we're talking about today. Then we also look at the school counselor assessment and appraisal through two different tools. And if you wanna learn more about any of those other components, check out those webinars. All right, here we go. Annual results reports, let's dive in. See, even my computer doesn't wanna go forward. It's like, no. <laughs> What is it doing? Oh, it went so far. Okay, see, it thinks you already know all of this. All right, our annual results reports are designed to ensure that school counseling programs are assessed for effectiveness and to inform those decisions related to program improvement. These reports are essential for a data-informed school counseling program. So like I said, really, really important piece of the puzzle. There are two types, like we already said, the classroom and group and the closing the gap. When we analyze the data from these reports, then our approach to meeting student needs is so much more informed because we know what works, we know what doesn't, we're more focused on the effective activities and interventions. These reports align with the action plans, like I already said, which we typically create at the beginning of the school year in that manage component. Um, when we look at the data from the results reports, then we want, to, well, we want to collect the data through these results reports, and we want to collect all three types of data, that participation, mindsets and behaviors, and outcome data. If you have questions about those three types of data, check out the webinar on data. Now, the purpose of looking at the results is because we want to see, like I said, what works and what didn't, what resulted in positive student outcomes and what didn't. And it is okay to find out that an intervention or a small group or a classroom lesson or a unit or a large group assembly didn't work. It's totally okay. What's not okay is to keep doing it over and over, even though our results report said it didn't work. Or what's also not okay is not having a results report to show if it worked or not, right? So if we're doing the same lessons every year, but we don't have annual results reports to go with them, we don't know that it works. We're repeating something that we don't know if it's effective, okay? So this, by analyzing this data, we can determine what worked, what didn't, and then make those changes and improvements as needed. So these results reports serve as tools to document the instruction. So we're documenting everything that we did that was both planned and then modified to meet student needs. 
We're verifying that all students were served. Remember, that's comprehensive school counseling. So we're showing that we didn't only provide that lesson to one group, we provided it to everyone because this is what comprehensive school counseling is all about. We are analyzing and explaining those three types of data, that participation, mindsets and behaviors, and outcome data. We're sharing that impact, we're showing what worked, what activities and services were impactful, and then informing improvement of those activities and interventions. So what needs to be tweaked or changed in some way. And then this supports advocacy for that systemic change, that bigger picture change that we're looking for as a result of our school counseling programs. My computer is very slow today. I don't know what's going on. I think it's going to jump ahead like three slides. Yep, there it goes. All right, so let's dive into just the classroom and small group results report first. So remember, there's the two types. This is the classroom and small group results report. So this is used to organize the, re the re results from either our classroom lessons. So when we go in and we teach instruction in a classroom setting or small group sessions. So we want to look at the effectiveness of both classroom and group activities. You're going to do these separately. I wish that they would distinguish that a little clearer. We don't use one results report for both, but it's the same document, okay? So if I did a bullying prevention classroom instruction unit, I would do a results report for that. If I did a small group on emotion management, I would do a different results report using the same template, but a completely different results report for that. I think that everyone understands that. All right, so when we do classroom results report, so let's do my bullying prevention unit as an example. Then we wanna ask the following questions to analyze the results. Did the student standards selected match the lesson topic? So when I selected my student standards, did it go with the idea of bullying prevention? It's a good reflection question. Did the lesson content match the mindset or behavior? So did everything align? Did the length of lessons allow time for students to acquire the content? Maybe I realized I didn't schedule long enough lessons or tried to squeeze too much in. Were the lessons delivered at the best time and in the most effective way? Maybe this is when you find out that the right after lunch time isn't the most effective time or something like that, okay? How did lessons support the desired change in achievement, attendance, or discipline data? So for my bullying prevention unit, my outcome data goal was to decrease discipline referrals related to bullying. Did that happen? Did it work, okay? Small groups, we wanna reflect on some questions too. So when we're analyzing a small group, we're going to analyze the whole, the whole unit or the whole set, multiple sessions. We're not going to analyze each session of a small group, but we'll, you know, if it's an eight, a eight lesson small group, we're meeting eight times, then at the end of all of that, we're going to reflect on how was the data used to identify small group topics. So I said emotion management, why, why was I doing that? Did I just pick that or did the data tell me that was a topic that was needed? How did I select participants? Did I just randomly put kids in this emotion management group or were they selected based on data and what data was used? How did the group content align with evidence-based or research-based or best practices? So was I just making up the emotion management curriculum or was I using an evidence-based curriculum? How did the group content materials match the selected student standards? So again, that alignment piece, we wanna make sure we're all aligned. And then how did the session topics support the desired change? So maybe my emotion management group, the desired change was a, well, it could be a variety of things. Maybe I picked this group because they had low attendance. And so my desired outcome was improved attendance. Or maybe their, the emotion management was because they weren't wanting to come to school. And so we were talking about the different emotions they were experiencing at school. And then the, the outcome goal was improved attendance, improved average daily attendance because as a result of 
processing through the emotions they were feeling and not wanting to come to school. Did it work? Did the attendance improve or not? All right, now I want to, before we get into the closing the gap results report, I wanna take a look at the template. So I think that's easier to understand that way. So bear with me, I wasn't going to do this, but I think it'll be helpful. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again. And this time you should be seeing the Classroom and Group Mindsets and Behaviors Results Report template. Now, this is Oklahoma's version. It's just like ASCA's. If you go to ASCA's website, same content, just branded with Oklahoma's logo. But you'll see here that it gives you a little description of what it's used for, and then you'll see the results report. So school name, easy, then you're going to check. So let's say I'm doing it for my bullying prevention unit. I'm going to check that. It's a unit of classroom lessons. If it was just one bullying prevention lesson, I would check single classroom lesson. If it was a small group on bullying prevention, I, of course, would check small group. But for this one, it's a unit. Grade level, I did this with third grade. Topic, bullying prevention. Now I would look up which mindsets and behaviors are aligned with this. You know those, we would just put these, so if it was social skills, um, let me just grab my, I think I have them sitting here. Oh, I don't. Well, that's okay. You know what those are. If you aren't familiar with this, go back and watch the students, Ask a Student Standards webinar um, or the Action Plans one. It's in there too. So then my mindset and behavior statement would be listed here. Then I'm going to get to my student standards pre and post assessment items. So here is where we are going to think about what our, our pre and post test questions are. So maybe I'm going to look, this is a really great book if you don't have this, the Ask Implementation Guide gives some great examples. Typically our questions are going to be Likert um, scaled. So we're going to ask like between one and four, where are they? Okay, so for that one, a question might be I'm trying to see if they have a good example, but I'm just going to say I know how to define bystander, meaning a bystander to bullying. Okay. And then there would be a Likert scale one through four, and they would grade themselves on that. So if they know what it is, they give them perfectly, know how to define it, know how to describe what one does, they might give themselves a four. If they have no idea, they'd probably give themselves a one, okay? So then we're gonna go down here. So this is our results report. So we wanna make sure we include our participation data. That's our first type of data, number of students. So there are 75 third grade students that got this unit. There were four, oh, no, 30 minutes for each lesson. And there were four lessons okay so there were four lessons 30 minutes each now i'm going to look at my data so my pre-assessment data so uh, when i did the pretest, the number first question was i know how to define bystander and on average when i averaged out the two the likert scale answers it was a 2.2 not very many students knew how to define bystander. This was a new vocabulary word for them. So it's pretty low. Now then, this is my results report. So I've already delivered the four 30 minute lessons. And so now I have my post assessment data. And following that, I asked them the same question. I know how to define bystander. And the average out of four was 3.8. So there was a big improvement there from 2.2 and to 3.8. So what I'd probably write was 2.2 able to define bystander. 3.8 able to define bystander, okay? And then of course I'd have other questions too, two, three, and four, but I'm just given the example of one here today. 
So then our outcome data. So remember my outcome goal was how to decrease the number of discipline referrals in relation to bullying. So bullying related discipline referrals. So this is of course made up, but maybe my baseline data is there were 12 discipline referrals. Okay, so that's my um, baseline data, 12 dis bullying related discipline referrals. So I'm gonna add that. Don't have a lot of room here. Bullying discipline referrals. Okay. So then my final data, so that was for the first quarter, there were 12 bullying discipline referrals. And then my final data, this next quarter, there were four bullying discipline referrals. Okay. So it was a decrease, right? So then my percent change, I would, I can't do that math on the top of my head, but it's decreased by eight and we would do a percentage change there. Okay. So that's, that's a good um, percentage change and that's a good outcome. Now we might've had a student outcome goal that was related to this. We might've said our goal was to decrease discipline referrals by 80%. So you could, could compare that there too. Again, we're making those connections of all of these different elements. Now, these last two questions are just reflection. So just asking you to reflect on your instruction. So how did the instruction facilitate the attainment of the identified ask the student standards and how could the unit be improved? It just gives you a chance to think through your, your unit here, okay? Pretty easy, right? I hope that that makes those um, results reports a little easier to understand. Now let's go back to our slide deck because now we're going to talk about the closing the gap results report. So the closing the gap results report and actually the new fourth edition of the Ask a National Model combined the closing the gap action plan with the results report. So like I said, go back and watch that webinar about the action plan. It's actually the same document. We're just going to add our results to the bottom of it. So that's really great. Um, and so if you go to page 54 in the Ask a National Model, you can read more about that, but I'm going to explain it here too. So here we're just um, using this to organize the, re the results, of course, of our closing the gap activities and intervention. So we want to use this again to analyze our results to see if they were effective. And of course, that helps inform our future practice. So when we're looking at our closing the gap results reports, we want to think about what data was used to identify the gap to begin with? So I often give the example in closing the gap plans as a one I did when I applied for ramp, and that was a closing the gap goal of decreasing kindergarten discipline referrals for students who did not attend pre-K. We noticed that students who had not attended pre-kindergarten had a significant number more discipline referrals than those who did attend pre-K. They didn't have that skill set that our pre-K students came to us with, and that resulted in discipline referrals. So I identified that gap through the data. So if you are doing a closing the gap action plan and results report, you want to know how your data was, uh, what data was used to identify the gap. We want to make sure it's an effective um, and accurate gap. How were evidence-based research informed or best practice activities selected? Okay, again, we wanna think through what we're doing, not just doing it for the heck of it. Oops, keep getting ahead of myself. Um, how did the multiple strategies or activities involve a variety of stakeholders? I love this question because in the example I gave, I brought in different community agencies, and different people to help me meet that closing the gap goal that I had because I couldn't do it on my own. So I worked with community agencies that did parent presentation, caregiver presentations. So thinking through what you're doing, it needs to be beyond just you. This is our school counseling program. We're using a variety of stakeholders. And then of course, the outcome is, is better for everyone. How did the content materials of the strategies or activities match the selected student standards? So same as our previous um, 
classroom and group results report. We want to make sure that alignment is there. And how did the activities and interventions support the desired change in achievement, attendance, or discipline data? So my example, again, was discipline data related. Um, and I was able to show how my activities and interventions resulted in improved discipline data. So let's take a look now. Of course, all of these results report templates can be found on ASCA's website, as always. Um, but we do have our Oklahoma specific ones if you want to use those as well. So we already looked at the classroom and group template, but now let's take a look at the closing the gap template. So you can see here, closing the gap, it is the action plan and the results report together. So all in one, you'll do the, uh, the action plan portion before, of course, you'll do that first, then you deliver the direct and indirect student services, and then you're going to report your results. So school name, annual student outcome goal, so decrease kinder discipline referrals for students who did not attend. 3K by 75% by May of 2022. Okay, something like that. Um, I'll list the two standards that align with that goal. I will again have pre and post assessment statements. So these are those pre and post tests that we use. We looked at these just um, with our last one. Let me see if I can give you another example here. Um, so you might ask questions on the mindsets and behavior survey. The examples here, obviously this doesn't go with my example, but I think it's helpful to hear other examples. This is a goal of decreasing English language learning students who earned a D in math, decreasing the number of English language learner students who earned a D in the first semester, um, trying to decrease that by the second semester. So their survey items were, how do you feel about making mistakes in math? Which best describes you in math class? And they gave some options. How often do you do math homework? How often do you complete math classwork? And name one person who can help you with math. So you can see some of those are Likert scale and some of them are open-ended and that's okay, but it gives us really good information. You can have more than four. Typically, we don't wanna to have too many though. The example I just read had five. If you wanted to add in more, you certainly could. All right, now I love this part of the closing the gap action plan and results report because it has us list the direct and the indirect student services we're going to provide to meet this goal. Super good idea because the direct student services, like in my example that I'm writing on here, the pre-K or the kinder students who didn't go to pre-K, I did a small group on school skills. So it was just a group about this things that you learn in school, like how to line up and what behaviors are expected in certain places and things like that, that again, these students were kind of behind because they came in at a different time than the other students. So I did a small group, that was a direct student service. I also coordinated caregiver um, presentations with local community agencies. So I didn't provide that direct service, but I, consulted with professionals and got them to come in. I also made referrals to mental health agencies, the students who needed additional mental health support. Okay, so you can see there, you would just write, I um, all the things, the direct and indirect student services you provide. I love that they include that on here. Systemic focus, I love that they include this too. Identify school or system policies, procedures, or practices that create or maintain inequities relevant to this goal. I can say that suspending, um, suspending students, that was a 
system policy that was impacting this. Students were getting sent home and then they were missing more school time, which was only making their skills decrease. So that was a systemic focus of this goal. And it was one of the best parts of it is that we were able to stop suspending students because of my focus on this. And then one to two strategies that in could, could influence systemic change related to this goal. So restorative practices is what we did instead of suspensions. Okay, so when a student had a behavior that maybe previously we would have suspended, we did a restorative practice of some sort of restorative circle with that student to help them understand what they had done and what they could do differently in the future instead of just suspending them that wasn't working. All right, so then we're going to look at our data. So our participation data, that's just how many students we anticipated, maybe 12 students, and maybe the actual was 11 students, one moved away. Okay, something like that. Mindsets and behavior pre-assessment results. So again, we're going to go to our Assessments up here are pre and post assessments, and we're going to look at the um, results. So we're going to calculate the average student response for each item in our pre-test and then in our post-test, okay, just like we looked at in my bullying prevention unit. And then outcome data plan, again, same as the classroom and group results report. We're going to look at the baseline data. The baseline data was 26 days out of school for the 15 students identified as not attending pre-K, okay? And my outcome, my final data was zero days because we stopped suspending them. Cool, huh? Okay, great improvement. Percentage change. I guess 100%, right? So that's super awesome. That's a great outcome goal and a great outcome data. Now, what if it would have been 27 days out of school? Do we just not do this because my outcome data is not good? It was higher? No, that tells us information too. Okay, what are we missing? What do we need to change, okay? What direct and indirect student services do we need to shift in order to meet these needs, okay? It's okay if the data isn't what we want it to be. That's not a problem. The problem is not making the change as a result of the data, or the other problem is not collecting the data to begin with. And then we get to reflect, just like we did with our classroom and group. How did the interventions facilitate the attainment of the student standards and what could be improved? Really, really, really great tool. I hope that you can see how helpful that is and how it's not as scary as we think once we really look at it. It, it really loses its power once we, we start to, um, peeling back the layers. It's not nearly as scary of a process, but it can be overwhelming to begin with. Like I said, I totally agree, but I hope that you can really understand now that it is, it's not nearly as frightening as we might think it is. And maybe you're not even frightened by it. Maybe you're like, Sarah, that's just you. I find results reports easy. And if that's you, then great. And I'd love to see examples of yours because I think it's fascinating to see these in action in our schools. They can be so, so powerful. They are amazing advocacy tools, which brings us to reporting the results, okay? So we don't wanna do all of this and not tell anyone. We wanna share this data. We wanna show how students are different because of our school counseling program. So we want to educate stakeholders about our program's impact on student achievement, attendance, and discipline because of our, our work, right? So we also um, want to make sure that we're showing, hey, when we get to spend our time providing these student services, look at the results. This is great. This is a great tool to combine with that use of time tool, because if you're not getting to do a lot of this, but when you do it, it makes a big impact. It's a great way to advocate for more time doing this. 
So we can share it in numerous ways, websites, infographics, slideshow presentations to stakeholders, one page handouts um, to administrators and school board members, put it on our district data material. This can be a part of your school wide results for the year. Your principal probably does a lot of collecting data too, but you could do a little portion of it just about your school counseling re um, results reports. That's really, really powerful. And again, an amazing advocacy tool. So implementation steps. We want to use the templates to share the results. Okay, we've already looked through those step by step, go through them, create charts or graphs of some of this, the data you collect. So we kind of looked at it in number form, but plug that into a quick Google sheet so that you get a pretty little graph that comes out. Super easy to do. Um, feel free to contact me if you want help with how to do that, but it's not hard at all. But a graph is so powerful. It's really helpful to be able to see it in a quick snapshot of a bar graph or something like that, showing that that impact on student achievement, attendance or discipline. Like we said, share a one page little document, a quick brief of all of this, and that can be really, really powerful as well. And in your one page document, you can combine a couple of different things. So you could do that bullying prevention unit and your closing the gap goal and some of your small group results reports kind of create a fun little one pager with some of your different positive results. And then explain how data results will help you improve your future practices. So tell stakeholders what that data told you and how you're using it. It's really, really, really helpful. And make sure you're connecting all the dots here. We want to use that lesson plan in conjunction with these results reports, right? We're first writing, well, we're actually first writing outcome goals and action plans. Then we're writing lessons to go with them. Then we're delivering the lessons. And then we're looking at the results of the lessons. Once you get the results, go back and edit the lesson plans with what needs to be changed. Remember, we talked about more time or clearer about different things. Maybe you feel like one of the lessons was confusing. Tweak your lesson plans right as you get the results so that you remember next year. Um, and they're already, they're already changed. They're already ready to go. Okay. All right. So end reflection to foster growth as we think about assessing our comprehensive school counseling program. Think through these six questions. How can results report reports inform the improvement of our activities and interventions? How does data collection more accurately, how could we collect more accurate data by asking better questions? That's really important. How can we target ASCA student standards that will have the greatest impact on student outcomes? How do we make decisions about which active activities and interventions to continue? That's what our data tells us, right? Or adjust or discontinue. How does data inform the selection of group topics, right? We should be really using data to decide that, not just because it's a fun curriculum. And how were gaps identified through data? right? That gap, that pre-KK gap was identified through data. I didn't just make that up. We saw a problem, we saw a gap, and we went to close it. So make sure we have the data to back those decisions. So in summary, our action plans are first completed in that managed component. Like we said, the activities and the action plans are driven by data, aligned with our goals, included in our calendars. Then we use our templates to track our results, and then we share those results with stakeholders. And remember, for that closing the gap results report, it's all in one. It's the same document, okay? All right. We did it. Breathe. Oh, it feels good. And it feels easier. I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to talk this out with you because I feel so much easier once you really talk it out. And once you start peeling back those layers, like we said, it's so doable. You all can do this work. This is so manageable, especially when we take it one step at a time. But if I can help you, please reach out, email, text, call me, Check out those other webinars. If anything I mentioned today is a little muddy, ask questions. I will gladly help you. We've got this. We will 
get there together. If we can't figure it out, we'll find someone who can help us. Check out this book, the ASCA Implementation Guide is super helpful. I use it all the time when I'm thinking through what type of data I need to collect or what type of survey items would help me collect that data. That's the stuff that's harder and it's, it's harder to wrap our minds around if we're just beginning it. But this book is helpful. I hope this webinar is helpful. Keep serving your students, keep learning new things, keep strengthening your school counseling program. And I will see you again very soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.